You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie. And before we jump into today's guest, I wanted to put a shout out to our friends at the New York Veterinary Show, which is happening next week in New York at the Javits Center, the 7th and 8th of November. It promises to be a great show. And my new company, Takatu, uh, we'll be exhibiting at the show as well. So hopefully we'll see some of you at the show. Feel free to stop up to our booth and say hello. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ivan. Why don't you go ahead and introduce today's guest? Hi, I'm Ivan Zak, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Tom Jenkins, a personal friend of mine and, uh, and quite an entrepreneur in the industry. So I'm, I'm super excited to introduce him. He's currently, on top of everything he's done in the past, is the co-founder and the CEO of Gula, which is a mobile telehealth platform. He's a non-executive director of Recruit for Vets. He's a co-founder of Team Reno and Conservation Awareness Group. He carries the degree of Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Cambridge, Cambridge in the UK, not in Ontario, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. There's no vet school in uh, Cambridge, Ontario. So on the personal side of things, he contributed to a television show filmed in South Africa where he carried for renos, giraffes, lions, zebras, oryx, and buffaloes. He is a fan of Lizzo, having seen her in Minnesota earlier this year. So let's jump in. Tom, super happy to see you here. Um, I want to, here. to um, probably walk a little bit more through. So this is, you know, this is kind of a stamp that we got off the internet and, and we have, but um, I love your story. You went to vet school. Then after that, you were building a consolidation group in Asia. Tell yeah. us just your, like background splash in addition to what we've outlined already. Yeah, I guess um, I always wanted to be a vet, but quite early on, I swapped a paper round for web development and I got some sort of commercial exposure, project management. Uh, So that's where that interest came from. And we're lucky to be in such a sort of diverse sector and profession that it was obvious that it would be possible to merge those two interests. And towards the end of vet school, I read a book by a guy called Jim O'Neill called The Growth Map, where he outlined the BRIC concept. So that's Brazil, Russia, India, China as the growth economies. And I decided, wouldn't it be great to sort of kick off my career in one of these emerging markets where there is this emerging pet owner population and there's this real opportunity to have quite a broad impact on um, sort of raising standards of care and increasing the accessibility of care. So that's sort of what led to me sort of leaving vet school to go straight out to China and operate clinics out there. And we ended up having a group of clinics in six cities across mainland China, Hong Kong and and Singapore. Um, So that was really the starting platform for the rest of my career to date. It's incredible. So uh, with the, so we had a sort of a telehealth, I think guest here, but they were more in the sort of uh, triage business. Why don't you tell us a little bit of where you sit with that and where do you think the opportunity is right now? I, I think I expressed my opinion about telehealth. I think it's early, to be honest, in the veterinary industry. And I think we, we aligned on that in one of the conferences. But if it is early, you're probably one of the first ones to tap into this market. And can you tell us why you think it's important and why did you choose this area? I guess it feeds into uh, my, the sort of the arc of my career being about increasing the accessibility of veterinary expertise. I think the uh, veterinary team are the best people to advocate for pets. And I suppose going out to China, opening clinics there uh, was a way to increase the accessibility of pet care to this emerging population of pet owners. And then Gula, so this chapter of my career now is about uh, lowering the barriers to accessing veterinary expertise in the first place. So it's about providing an effortless getting on point to engage with veterinary care that can compete with Googling or actually more than Googling, pet owners just hoping for the best, which is actually the biggest competitor for veterinary care, veterinary clinics. In terms of it being early or not, it's super interesting here because it's certainly true that not many pet owners are accessing veterinary care remotely in terms of using an app or video consultation. But in terms of uptake of telemedicine, every clinic in the world does it in some form. So they might not do it in a constrained way or the most optimized way, 
that we would like to provide for them. But they certainly do it via the phone calls or emails or even WhatsApp messages, Facebook groups, that sort of thing. So adoption is probably further along than, than we think. It's just not formalized or optimized. Interesting. And when you say the owners are just hoping for the best, do you mean those owners that come with a five days vomiting blood animal and say, is this still okay? Yeah. And I think that's the, the, the bias for vets is even that example is an example that you do see in the clinic. Sometimes you don't see that pet because it was too late. Or yep. when I'm having these conversations about telemedicine, and I quote the Veterinary Innovation Council stat that 92% of all pet issues go unaddressed by veterinary expertise. The vets assume those are kind of trivial things, but we've seen in Gula already, uh, one of the cases we had was a grumbling UTI that had been going on in this Labrador, 40-month-old Labrador, for months and months. And the pet owner had to take that pet outside to the toilet like eight to 10 times a day And this was an experienced pet owner. They had two other dogs. They just assumed this behavior was normal for that dog. And their heuristic that they used for accessing veterinary care to tell them when they needed to pick up the phone to the vet was, is my dog in pain? And they didn't perceive that dog to be in pain. So they did not reach out for veterinary expertise. They did not initiate the high effort process of accessing veterinary expertise. But when they saw that they had the ability to just do a video call or a text chat with a vet, even that vet just telling them, hey, you need to go through that process. You need to come into the clinic because this is something we can solve. This is something that we can resolve was value added to their experience and meant that that issue was then addressed by veterinary expertise when it otherwise wouldn't have been. So I think there is this bias of, it's actually enshrined in the regulation in the UK and elsewhere where we talk about the animal under our care and that's the focus of the responsibility of uh, the vet. But there's so many animals that we just never see or don't see as much as we should. I think we do have a responsibility to advocate for them as well. And I think telemedicine is about broadening the top of the funnel. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, um, well, it, technology as well as any business, I think, succeeds when you start removing the barriers or, or really the friction of accessing the care. And, and I think that that's what you're doing. In one of the conversations that we had with you, I think that you mentioned the statistics that there's technically two to three reasons a month for a pet owner on a reasonably healthy animal to reach out to veterinarian with a question, but they just don't. There's a cost barrier, there's a fear barrier, there's a travel barrier, there's all of these things that telemedicine seems to solve. Yeah, and we surveyed pet owners where they talk about their beautiful relationship with their vet. So it's not, it's not anything that we're doing wrong inherently. I mean, who talks about their beautiful relationship with their accountant or their lawyer? I'm mean, gonna get complaints off my accountant and lawyer now, but we're in a really privileged position as a profession that we're very highly regarded. So it's not that that's blocking people from accessing expertise. And it is things like um, having to load the kids into the car seat. And I think we do a really good job as a sector of if someone needs something doing to their pet, they will come to us. But what we do a less good job of is capturing people at the point of curiosity. So we capture them at a point of need, but we don't capture them at a point of curiosity. And we don't value the things that we can offer that pet owners really do value. So for example, our Googling skill, we can provide this really well curated set of resources. So just by pushing out an article on vomiting in dogs that you have found on Google and you have found to be credible and providing that to a pet owner, that is value additive to that pet owner. But very few vets see that. And so this idea of a curated digital pet care experience is incredibly compelling to pet owners, but vets don't always realize that just by giving that advice, you are creating value. You don't have to have done something. Yeah, it's really interesting. Tom, I want to jump in there. One of the posts that I saw on social media from you, I think last year was kind of the rise of digitalization and pet care. And it's interesting because there's definitely more players in the space. You know, it's definitely something that's getting very interesting, but it seems like there's a reluctance of the pet owners to jump on board. And I liken this to kind of the adoption of technology, you know, in general. Consumers typically, you know, will adopt technology first. And it seems like it's kind of like almost a reverse. You know, there's these enterprises driving these digital platforms, but it doesn't seem like the consumers are maybe ready for it yet or the exposure hasn't been there yet. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and kind of how you see that playing out over the next 12 to 18 months? 
it's really about how you pursue digitalization and where digitalization has been pursued has that been a positive thing for the sector in which it's happened and so the way i think about digitalization in veterinary is pets are fundamentally physical things you can't upload them to the cloud and so you need this network of physical locations clinics where they can be taken to receive the very highest possible standards of care so trying to digitalize away the, that part of the aspects of pet ownership um, i think is incorrect but you can digitally augment these services so i think for pet owners to really engage with these digitalization opportunities they have to see it being led by their trusted veterinarian and we know it's going back to that pet owner that described the relationship with their vet as beautiful the vet has this very trusted place where if the vet says this is a means by which you can interact with me you can receive the best advice you can know with full confidence whether or not you need to come in and see me that is much more credible than let's say a direct consumer play with a vet sitting in a call center somewhere and they're not the ones that are going to ultimately deliver that joined up healthcare experience so i think it's really about how you do it we haven't reached that tipping point where enough veterinary clinics have engaged with this opportunity. I think we're getting there and we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm, but we're not there yet. So uh, it is a bit chicken and egg, but that's, that's true of any sort of marketplace or platform that supply and demand dynamics really come into play in a big way. Yeah, with what Sean asked there, I think that it's also, it is region dependent, but it's also by saying that, that pet owners don't want to reach out digitally. I don't think that that's the case. Well, at least not in, in Europe, maybe in, in Canada where Sean is at. But I'm in Ukraine right now, and we're, re, you know. Let's talk I, I about just, that. Let's talk about the Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I, there's a barber shop here that I was recommended. Not that I need that with my new haircut. But technically, through the app, you can book an appointment at a barber shop. It's really kind of high end. You can come in, have a shot of whiskey there, sit down, have a chat. Like, it's a super fancy place, but it's like, it's all digital. Why would that person not who, want that? Who recommended a barbershop to you? Like, um, it <laughs> was a friend a, of yours? I wear a toupee in Ukraine. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> again, a bold joke. You don't get anything else. <laughs> so, so anyway, time. but that, that person, you know, who uses that app or who recommended me that app, they would want the same experience from their veterinarian and it's all over the place. So I think it's really not about the pet owners. I think it's the vets that really behind and that they don't know how to pitch those services so i think to me the whole struggle with telemedicine or all of these apps is to make it engaging to have it in the owner's pocket because you know if i have some sort of app that beeps in my pocket to remind me about the vaccination one you know one time a year i wouldn't keep it but if, yeah. if this is something that i can access <clears throat> clear through or this is my you know my emergency button that i call my veterinarian that makes sense. But the question that I have to you, Tom, on that is then, well, yeah. how do you make veterinarians available? Because this is my struggle. How with telemedicine, veterinarians would accommodate to their day to, to really be available. One thing is to say, hey, this is the channel to reach out. And yeah. then how, how do you make yourself available? So maybe your technology solved that. I think a, a real differentiator of our product is it's role-based. So we engage the whole veterinary team in communicating with uh, pet owners. So receptionists, nurses, and vets can all be on there. It's also veterinary team-led. Uh, the operational complexity of veterinary clinics is staggering. When you think that any number of types of pet could come in with any number of issues requiring any combination of thousands of products and services, there's incredible operational complexity. And different clinics operate, try and overcome this operational complexity in different ways with different operational models. So I think... One thing that goes wrong with software or any solutions really implemented in veterinary clinics is they add to that complexity rather than reducing that complexity. And so our product is very much there to fit around the model of any veterinary clinic. So it could be a one vet clinic or it could be a, a large hospital or a group of large hospitals because it's very much what is offered to the pet owner and how those expectations are set are very much led by that veterinary team. And really, we think that telemedicine should not be exceptionalized. It shouldn't be this thing that you offer to one side of your main business. It should be completely integrated in the business of being a vet. So you book a video consult just like you book any other consult. A receptionist responds to 
a text chat message coming in just like they would respond to a phone call. So it's about how do you integrate it into, into that workflow. And I think there's actually a huge capacity utilization opportunity here where having telemedicine in your business can improve your capacity utilization. Now, also, we're in largely a private healthcare environment where if, as we believe telemedicine will be, it is market expansive, it increases the total addressable market for that many expertise, well, we can open more clinics, we can train more vets, although that, that may be a bottleneck currently, and hire more of them to do more patient advocacy, which from my perspective is the right way to go about this. This should be market expansive. And there are some direct consumer plays which feel more uh, market erosive, whereas I think that people aren't accessing veterinary expertise as often as they should or would want to if they could. It's not a case of the market being overserved or anywhere near overserved currently. That's brilliant. With the extension of the operational model in the veterinary hospital, where do you see, if you had a dream hospital or a group of hospitals, or if you were to partner up with a new consolidator that would say, look, we want to incorporate telemedicine to the core of our processes. We want it from our strategic plan. We want it as a part of it. Do, did you have that experience or did you conceptualize what that would look like? Where in their process? Is it like sequestered time of the veterinarians or group of veterinarians? They take turns of taking those appointments. Is it just a regular book of appointment where one is online, one is not, what it would look like in their facility. Cause you know, some vets sit 10 people in a row in a little room with the interns and everybody yelling. So what, what yeah. would that look like in ideal world? Yeah, I think um, integrating it as far as possible into existing workflows um, makes much more sense than having a dedicated resource for telemedicine. We have had clinics and clinic groups that want to do it different ways. And uh, we can definitely flex through that and the product can be used basically however you want to use it, however you want to set it up. But I think, again, for this to be sustainable long-term, for it to deliver the advantages we think it can deliver, it shouldn't be exceptionalized. It shouldn't be put in a box. It shouldn't be a separate strategic business unit. It should be just as natural for a vet to do a video consultation as it is for them to do an in-person consultation. And vets and nurses should become very comfortable switching between the two, depending on what's appropriate for that patient and for that pet owner. There's actually quite a useful shortcut to work out um, whether uh, telemedicine is the most appropriate medium for that consultation. I tell people, if the consultation seems to be more for the pet owner than the pet, then telemedicine is a fantastic route to go down. If the, consultation is, <laughs> if the consultation is more for the pet than the owner, get them in and get hands on on, on the animal. Um, that's and, a lot, that's think, the line. <laughs> yeah, that makes every, every, love it. Every vet can understand what that means. We all do lots of consultations which are more for the pet owner, and that's perfectly reasonable. That's as it should be. But there's no reason you can't do that remotely. Now, with that, if I could triage which ones for the owner and which ones for the pet, I would actually yeah. choose to be in the hospital doing only those for the pet. <laughs> So I don't want to do those for the owner. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> there could be there could, there could be vets that are better at one than the other. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, this is why I haven't started software companies now. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> move, moving swiftly along. No, no I've got a, I've got a, yeah, exactly. I've got a couple of questions for you, Tom. One is, why haven't some of the larger, or have, I guess it's a two-part question, why or have any of the larger consolidators worked this into the workflow? And to me, it seems like it's going to take something like a VCA or a Mars or a Blue Pearl or one of the larger consolidators in the UK to start driving this idea of digital health before they'll have mass adoption. Because if it's down to the veterinarian that has the relationship with the client to promote yeah. these services and help get the adoption started, it seems like that's gonna be the way to actually make waves in this area. Would you agree or disagree and have or haven't they? I agree 100% that, that vets are pivotal to this. Actually, uh, when I started Gula, it was a key question for me is, we have a really great value proposition for pet owners around convenience um, and improving the life of their pet. And we have a great proposition for clinics around monetization of a previously unmonetizable touch point, improved capacity utilization, lead generation, client acquisition, et cetera. But why does a vet or another member of the veterinary team uh, want to engage with this? And we beta tested um, our first, our MVP across 40 different clinics. And we found that vets were incredibly engaged with it and they found vets will get on board with in general 
anything that advances their patient advocacy efforts and leads to better patient outcomes and improves their ability to deliver clinical excellence. And this definitely seems to be a tool that does that. And I, again, another analogy I use is imagine I'm selling you an ultrasound and telling you it can diagnose everything and cure everything. You, you wouldn't believe me and you'd tell me to get out of town. But if I told you this is a tool that can improve your patient advocacy efforts, um, it's going to be better in your hands and less good in this other person's hands, uh, depending on your, your skill in using it, um, and you'll probably get better over time. That's much more analogous to what telemedicine is like. And so I think vets are getting on board with it. They are seeing that it's becoming less scary. Um, the assumption that somehow telemedicine means you're going to be sitting in some foreign country prescribing opioids to a, to a dying dog somewhere distant. I think that's, that sort of scare story is dissipating. And yes, actually, large veterinary groups are doing it. I think VCA bundles text chat with their pet health plans and IVC Evidencia in the UK and Europe have built a platform. And this creates a really interesting window of opportunity for us because it's, you know, look, people at clinics are doing it. And that means you need to do it as well. So other clinics are doing it. So the rest of the clinics should have an offering to pet owners because it's, it's soon going to become an expectation that this is something that you offer. There's also insurer-backed providers that are direct to consumer, which provides another sort of incentive for clinics to say, hey, we should be offering this. Ultimately, if you're asking from a competitive point of view, is that a threat that the larger veterinary groups are doing it? I think it provides that incentive for other clinics to do it and we can, we can help them do that. And ultimately, without wanting to disparage anyone else, they're not technology companies. This is what we do. This is all we do. This is what we think about day in, day out. We live this and we will be uh, relentlessly iterating on this because if there's one thing that is 100% for sure, no one has got telemedicine right yet. You know, we think we have a great product with great features that does a subset of things incredibly well. But the extent of this opportunity and the new technologies that, and the opportunities that's going to open up, you need to be running fast just to stand still. It's that whole red queen thing. And there's a question mark there over who's best place to do that. And I think our relentless focus on this space is what gives us an edge there. That makes sense. You know, and, and there's this whole, the idea or the, the concept telehealth to me sounds dated. We may as well call it fax machine health. Yeah. You know, because there's all of these different iterations in it. You know, there's people texting, there's people calling on the telephone, but a true digital experience where you can interact and even, you know, draw on the screen. There's almost a graduated telehealth or telemedicine that exists out there that maybe, you know, you, it sounds like you guys are driving very much towards it, but having the people that we have had on the show, you know, we've had Brendan, the technology and innovation lead for VCA on the show. Yeah. Everybody's touching these things, yeah. but nobody's doing mass adoption. And I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty positive that VCA hasn't sent an internal memo out to all of their veterinarians that say, telemedicine is now part of our offering. Please promote it at every consult. And I think yeah. it's going to take that type of engagement with those larger organizations, like I said, bringing it into the workflow before it actually, before we see mass adoption. And then the other thing I would say, and, and I'm interested to get you explain the experience, I think it's going to have to be an app that's so easy to use that grandma can use it, you know, and, and I think of Uber or Lyft or these ride hailing apps that are so easy to interact with, whether you're on yeah. the driver's side or the customer side. That's what I think telehealth is going to need to be in order for it to get the type of adoption that is available for it. So a couple things, you know, we have a lot of veterinarians right into the show every week. And yeah. I'd like you to explain it to the veterinarian that doesn't understand the experience. So if they're interested to learn more info, they know what it is that you guys do and how that interaction looks. So we're all about setting up clinics to deliver telemedicine. And really, you're right. Telemedicine is the wrong word. You should be talking about client engagement. And it should be a sort of no-brainer. You know, do you want to engage more often and more deeply with your pet-owning population? If you could, would that improve the life of pets? Would it improve your business? I think there's this very obvious win-win-win where it's good for pet owners, good for pets, and good for vets and clinics. And that's why I think, just sort of linking back to earlier in our conversation, you don't want to silo it. You don't want this to be a sort of dedicated resource where we offer telemedicine on the side. You do want to integrate it into your existing workflows and your existing team to engage with this. 
And I think a really interesting way to talk about it with vets and the veterinary team more broadly is right now there's this incredible pressure to just, just extract every ounce of advocacy opportunities from that vaccination consultation or that annual health check because you're not sure you're going to see that pet owner again. So if they come in with one thing, you need to talk to them about these 10 other things because that's your chance that year to advocate for that patient. That's an incredible amount of pressure. And I think it feeds into why there's this sort of idea that vets are uniquely bad salespeople. You know, they're very bad at advocating for what the vet needs. Well, it's because we don't set them up to succeed and say, you know, vets won't recommend something if they don't think it's in the interest of the pet. So that's a fantastic starting point. You don't have to worry in the main about anyone, you know, any bad actors there. So if they're recommending it, it means they really want the pet owner to have it. So imagine if we could just reduce that pressure a little bit and say, rather than this one visit, this one time you've been able to convince the pet owner to overcome the high effort experience of coming into the clinic. Instead, we're going to take those advocacy opportunities and we're going to split them up and we're going to spread them over the year. And they're going to look different. Sometimes they'll be in the clinic. Sometimes it will just be a text chat exchange. Sometimes it will be a video consult. Sometimes it will be a push notification that they open up on their phone and they get a video of how to actually get the tablets you prescribed into the cat, for example. Imagine that. And I think every vet just feels, when, when we have these conversations, they just, you can feel the weight lifting off them as they think, that is a world I want to be a part of. If I could have this ongoing conversation with pet owners about a digitally curated optimized pet care experience for their pet and the exact context of that pet. I think that feels good. And that's something we can all get on board with. I think it's just incredible. The things that we can do today, you could get every seven year old or older Labrador and send a push notification to them and say, has Daisy been having trouble getting up on the sofa? And all of a sudden you've got that pet owner engaged in a conversation about osteoarthritis or you know, send me a picture of your pet smile. Did you know that, you know, 80% or more pets suffer from dental disease? All of a sudden, you're on the pathway to getting that pet a dental that year. I think these are incredible opportunities for vets. And I think vets are, as they discover this, they're getting pretty excited about the opportunity there. Absolutely. I, you know, I was thinking that when you were saying about that one appointment, I don't remember where I've seen the stats, but on average, I believe it's the 17 minutes that veterinarian engages with any given pet per year, 17 minutes. That's all we have to pitch everything we want to sell them or recommend to them a year. That's difficult and terrible. So stretching it over a period of time and having access to them to make those recommendations and not sound like salespeople. Yeah. Um, that's just, that's just incredible. That, that 17 minutes. Remember we say that the pet owner is most likely to come in to the clinic at point of need. So they're in a need state. They're worried about something and you're trying to feed them other messages that are super important to their pet, but not what they're worried about in that need state. It's just not going to be the most effective way of doing things. Yeah, It's going to bounce right off them. They're not even yeah, going to hear it. They, they came in with a, with the engine light on and you're trying to sell them the shocks and the windshield wipers and everything. That's, really, that's, that's, it. that's what we're doing. So it, we, we always talk about a couple of things that are related to the whole kind of industry problem. One of them is the burnout. And, uh, and the whole suicide issue. And I don't know if this is an issue in the UK as well, but definitely in North America. Oh, it certainly is. It is too. Okay. So yeah. that's, yeah, it's the same. Not in Canada. Everybody's happy. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then another one that is coming up is the lack of vets. Hopefully it's not because of those issues. It's not that bad. But just that there's not enough veterinarians out there. And especially with the consolidation they're leaving the hospitals because of the change of culture and, you know, and, and everything that comes with the consolidation. So do you see telemedicine and the access to different types of services allowing veterinarians for more balanced lifestyle and potentially augmenting their income through doing something like telemedicine and uh, supplementing uh, their regular day-to-day -day work and making it a little bit more flexible and, and maybe even available to uh, do a little bit more traveling and working at the same time? The answer is 100% yes, definitely. Some of the work we've been doing at Recruit for Vets is related to this. And when I was at university, I did an elective in business and I validated the net promote score as a, a measure of customer satisfaction in the veterinary context. And in that work, we found that a good benchmark NPS client net promoter score 
and that's how likely you would be to recommend a certain vet clinic to a friend, colleague, or family member as a client. A good benchmark level is 60%. Okay, the scale is from minus 100% to positive 100%, and the veterinary benchmark is about 60%. It changes depending on how you collect it, but 60% is an incredibly good score. Clients, in general, enjoy the veterinary experience. Um, at that point of need, we service what they want done to the animal pretty well. Recruit for Vets surveyed a load of vets and nurses, and they, on the employer NPS. So how likely would they be to recommend their employer? And this ENPS has been found to be a leading indicator of staff turnover, staff churn. And it was negative 30 something percent Whoa. for both vets and, and wow. nurses. And this is very unusual to find this discrepancy. Let's take a credit card company. Usually they have a very low client NPS and quite low employee NPS, right? It's quite a stressful place to work because clients are not very happy in general. If they've called you up in the call center, they're complaining about something. So this idea that we've got this quite disengaged, quite burnt out, as you said, compassion fatigued population of team members going above and beyond to do an incredible job for clients. At some point, something's got to give. And one of the answers there is flexible working patterns. And veterinary has just been inherently an inflexible job you have to be in the clinic to do it and i was actually presenting gula the telemedicine platform to a group of clinics and one of the vets came up to me afterwards and said look i really hope we go for this because i've just had to say that i'm leaving because it's no longer my work is no longer compatible with my home life i love this clinic i love these people but i just can't can't keep it up and if telemedicine allowed that clinic to keep that passionate employee engaged with them working for them working with them i think that's an incredible opportunity and imagine if there was a veterinary job ad advertised that said you can work at home for one day a week i don't think vets particularly want to work less i think in general we're you know incredibly hard work and very achievement driven achievement oriented, oriented people but we do have lives that we need to fit into our work into our passion into our vocation and I think this does provide an opportunity to actually restore some balance. There's lots of aspects of this that you can tell I find incredibly exciting. I want to geek out over, but that's one that I'm very passionate about. I think, yeah, I think it is a part of the answer. It's not all of the answer, but it's part of the answer. Thanks so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. We're pretty social people, so you'll find us on every social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at the veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening.